Congratulations to everyone who recently passed their exam. When you pass, let us know so we can include you in our shout out. Other than that, let's keep working hard, keep studying hard, get to our questions. David engages in severe self-injurious behavior that occurs when transitioning away from preferred activities. David's BCBA wants to design an intervention to target David's self-injury. What experimental design would be the least appropriate for you to use? Now, you're going to see this question on almost all of my practice exams and in some of my practice question videos because it might be the most common ethical scenario that comes up when we talk about experimental design. The idea that when we work with the populations that we work with, we see a lot of self-injury. We see a lot of aggression. We see a lot of dangerous behavior that needs to be addressed immediately. And now when we plan for this type of behavior and we want, when we want to design interventions, we have to be careful with the designs we use. And why is that? Well, if we design an effective intervention, we want to make sure that effective intervention stays in place. And if we are with a client who engages in severe self-injurious behavior, and we are designing an experimental design, we want to make sure whatever intervention we're using isn't removed if it's working. So which one of these is the least appropriate? What about an alternating treatment? Now, we're not technically removing the intervention, right? Because we're alternating between one intervention and another. As soon as you see an intervention is working, especially for severe self-injurious injurious behavior, you have the option to continue that treatment, right? We don't need to reverse that design. However, with an ABA design, we do need to reverse it, right? A is going to be baseline, so is self-injury. B is going to be our intervention. And let's say our intervention is effective and David self-injury drastically decreases. Are we really going to sit there and reverse our design, remove it, and then have David self-injury potentially come back? No, right? That would be unethical. Okay, so if you're going to target this behavior, we want to avoid things like ABA designs and withdrawal designs. Multiple baseline and multiple probe are fine. You could do a multiple baseline across settings. You could do a multiple probe across settings. Again, these are okay because we're not withdrawing and we're not reversing it, right? The intervention is staying in place if it's working. Only with this ABA design do we have to actually withdraw it even if it's working. And in fact, it's better if it's working because then when we withdraw it, we can prove some sort of functional relation. Question two, you spent the last month creating a behavior plan. You mean with all of your RBTs to go through it step-by-step step with each of them. Once they acknowledge, they understand, you start to train them. You then monitor their implementation for errors. What should you do next? Okay, kind of a lengthy question. This is a supervision slash management question, which people have a hard time with, okay? What you need to remember is supervision, personnel management is just like teaching clients, okay? We set goals, we train, we model, and then we reinforce and correct. That last part is key, and that's the part people forget if they're training RBTs or other staff. They would set goals, they'll train, they'll model, but then they'll forget that reinforcement part. That's when we get bad treatment, and that's when we get RBTs who quit, et cetera, et cetera. We can't forget that part. So in this case, you have a behavior plan. You've met with all the RBTs to go step by step, right? So you've explained it to them. You set goals. They acknowledge it, and you train them. You then monitor their implementation for errors, which is great. What's next? Well, we need to decide, are they doing it correctly? And if they are, how can we continue them doing it correctly? So do we need to reevaluate the plan? Well, we don't know yet, right? Because all we're doing now is monitoring their implementation for errors, okay? So error correction is important, but we also need to monitor and reinforce when they're doing the right thing. So we don't want to reevaluate quite yet. What about training the parents? Well, training the parents is going to be separate, a separate plan entirely than training your RBTs, okay? C, finding opportunities to reinforce the RBTs. Absolutely. As you're monitoring and implementing for errors, you're also going to be identifying when they do things correctly. When they do it correctly, we need to reward them. Praise, uh, gift cards, raises, days off, whatever is going to reinforce that positive behavior, right? We want to reinforce it. It's just like clients. We can't forget that part. And then fade the plan out. No, we just implemented it. Okay, no need to fade it right now. The only option that makes sense is finding opportunities to reinforce the RBTs. You meet with them, you talk about it, you set goals, you train, you monitor, you reinforce. 
Blaine is bragging to his co-workers about his most recent experiment. He was able to grow plants that were resistant to bugs. Blaine's enemy tells him that it doesn't matter because it will never work anywhere but in a lab. Blaine's enemy is addressing what? When you have multiple people, and the question is specifically asking about a behavior, make sure you identify what behavior they're asking about. Here we're talking about Blaine's enemy, right? And what is Blaine's enemy doing? He tells Blaine that it's never going to work anywhere but in a lab. Now, Blaine's enemy isn't saying that this experiment isn't effective in the lab, right? Maybe he was able to grow plants that were resistant to bugs. Blaine's enemy is saying, sure, you can do it in the lab, but it's never going to generalize. And when we talk about generalizing an experiment or taking an experiment to a different setting, different environment, what are we talking about? Well, not internal validity. Internal validity has to do with functional control. It has to do with us controlling what's happening in that experimental setting. We're talking about external validity, right? Can we grow plants that are resistant to bugs in a field, right? In an actual farm, in a place where it's going to matter. An experimental setting, just like with our clients and behaviors, is one thing. Can it happen in the real world is a whole other thing entirely. So Blaine's enemy is doubting this experiment has external validity. We're not talking about determinism. Determinism says behavior is lawful, the lawful orderly place. Behavior happens for a reason. We're not talking about behavior here. And we're not talking about the confounds of the experiment. Okay, Confounds are what's going to get in the way of that functional control. Blaine's enemy is specifically addressing external validity by saying it's never going to work anywhere but in a lab. Which of the following is the best example of a comparative analysis? This is a tricky question because people read it too quickly. We have three types of analysis we can perform. Comparative, component, parametric. Component and a parametric okay, are associated. With those, we're looking at a, let's say, intervention package. And a component, we're comparing different parts of the intervention package. In a parametric, we're going to look at one part and identify how much of that part we need. So the common example is medicine. We have Advil, we have Tylenol. We're going to do a component analysis to see which one we're going to use. And then we'll do a parametric analysis to see how much Tylenol we need. A comparative analysis is just comparing different things, but not necessarily as a part of a package. And that's the key. So we're looking for something where we're comparing, let's say, different interventions, right? But not as part of a package. So A, Grant was offered $10 to cut the lawn. He said no. So he was then offered $20 to which he accepts the offer. Does this look like the type of medicine or the dosage? To me, it looks like the dosage, right? How much money is it going to take to get Grant to mow the lawn? $10 didn't cut it. It looks like $20 will cut it. So we did a parametric analysis here. We compared how much money it would take to get Grant to cut the lawn. After most of her students passed the exam, Carol evaluated the different procedures she had used in conjunction leading up to the exam. That's the key. Carol had a treatment package. And when we compare the different procedures in a package, we're doing a component analysis. We're looking at the different components. A mom told her kids that dinner was ready, but no one came downstairs. She then said dessert was ready and everyone rushed downstairs. Okay, so this isn't necessarily any sort of package, right? We don't have a treatment package or in a conjunction. We're just using different types of interventions, right? First, mom says dinner's ready. It doesn't work. Then said dessert's ready. Everyone rushed downstairs, okay? She's not evaluating a package. She's just independently identifying which individual procedure is going to be most effective. This is the comparative analysis. And then D, Dave used a DRO, DRO procedure when his client was screaming. None of them, right? We're just looking at the type of procedure. Ms. Fournier yells at her kids to stop talking whenever she is on the phone. So now when she picks up the phone, her kids stop talking. Ms. Fournier is a what? All right. I remember this question when I was in school. It was my favorite question because it really... A light bulb came on when I read it, right? It really highlighted the importance of being specific. What do we know? We know Miss Fournier is involved. We know she yells at her kids to stop talking whenever she is on the phone. 
now when she picks up the phone, her kids stop talking. So we can think that yelling at the kids to stop talking has punished the talking, right? Now, are we talking about this yelling at our kids, right? So if, if we think about the antecedent um, is picking up the phone, kids are talking, the consequence is the yelling, the consequence is punishing the talking, but we're not talking about the yelling. We're talking about Miss Fournier herself. Is Miss Fournier the punisher? Well, no. Miss Fournier is not the punisher, right? Either yelling at her kids or even picking up the phone is going to be the punisher, right? Because when she picks up the phone, her kids stop talking. It's got nothing to do with Miss Fournier, okay? Because Miss Fournier has been standing there the whole time. Only when she picks up the phone, do her kids stop talking. All Miss Fournier is, is is a stimulus. And you might say, well, this is too specific. This is what the exam wants. They want you to be specific. They want you to know a punisher is the, the actual stimuli or stimulus that is changing the behavior. Same with the reinforcer. Ms. Fournier is just a stimulus in the environment. Okay, We need to break things down as, as the environment and pieces of the environment. Stimuli and consequences and antecedents. You got to be very specific. We know Ms. Fournier is not a prompt. Ms. Fournier is not the consequence, right? And that's an even better way to look at it. Is Ms. Fournier a consequence? No. So she can't be a punisher or reinforcer. She's just a stimulus. Again, yes is specific, but you have to be specific on the exam. Joey is shown a picture of an apple, and he says, apple. Joey is shown the apple again and says, fruit. Joey is demonstrating what? All right. So immediately, if you've been studying, you should think generalization. Okay. We have Joey, who is shown a picture of an apple, and he says, apple. Joey is shown the apple again and says, fruit. How many responses are there? Well, we have two, right? We have apple and fruit. How many stimuli do we have? We have picture of an apple, shown the picture of an apple again, so one stimuli. Two responses, one stimuli. What is our rule when we're talking about response and stimulus generalization? We ask ourselves how many responses, how many stimuli. If we have a single stimulus with multiple responses, it's going to be response generalization. If we have multiple stimuli with one response, it'll be stimulus generalization. So again, we have apple and fruit, two responses for one stimulus. We are generalized, or Joey is generalizing response generalization. It's not maintenance because teaching is still going on. It's not reflexivity because we're not talking about stimulus equivalence here. We're simply generalizing these responses, okay, to this picture of an apple. A major ethical concern when using punishment is what? You will be asked ethical questions in regards to different procedures, things like punishment, reinforcement, empirical studies, experimental designs, and you need to know them, especially with punishment, because remember, we're a reinforcement-driven um, science. So when we use punishment, we need to be aware of what could go wrong. So what is a major, major ethical concern? A, punishment teaches unwanted behavior. Well, punishment doesn't teach behavior, right? Punishment decreases behavior. That's part of the problem is punishment doesn't teach behavior. Not that it teaches unwanted behavior. It just doesn't teach behavior. B, punishment is not permanent. Yes, right? That is the issue. Once you remove punishment or once the person habituates to punishment, right? Punishment starts to lose its effectiveness. If you remove it, the effectiveness is gone altogether. It's not permanent. What about C? Punishment is not effective with operant behavior. Well, we know that's not true. Punishment is effective. We just need to be careful when using it. Punishment cannot be undone. That's very untrue, right? If you remove punishment, the effects will slowly wear off. That's the ethical concern. Punishment is not permanent, okay? The issue here is we're not teaching a replacement behavior. We're only punishing a behavior. And when the punishment stops or when that person gets used to the punishment, the punishment loses its effectiveness. A coach observes that his players are motivated by playing music at practice. He tells them for every 10 shots they take after practice, he will allow them to play 30 minutes of music at practice. He starts to increase the requirement, and when he changes the requirement to 50 shots, the player stops shooting after practice. If the music is still reinforcing what is probably occurring. Don't overthink this question. It's long. There's some things going on. 
Don't overthink it. What do we know? Always ask yourself, what do I know, right? We're asking about the music and what is probably occurring. Well, the problem is the players stop shooting, right? The coach observed the players. Every 10 shots, he allowed them to play 30 minutes of music of practice. It was working fine. All of a sudden, he got to 50 shots, and now the players stopped shooting. Apparently, 50 shots is too many, where the response effort is just too high. So the schedule has changed, right? Before, it started with the FR10, right? 10 shots, you get reinforced. Now you need 50. And when we change a reinforcement schedule and responding decreases, what do we call that? Is it satiation? Well, what do we know? We know the music is still reinforcing. Don't skip that part. This is why we need to read the question carefully. Because we really want to understand everything about it. Because the information given in the question is what you need to answer the question. right? And that sounds obvious, but people read questions quickly and they miss things. Since we know the music is still reinforcing, we know it's not satiated. Escape. Well, not necessarily, right? They're just not shooting. That's not a requirement, okay? They don't have to shoot, but they, they get reinforced for shooting, but they're not escaping from anything. Ratio strain. Yes, okay? If we thin a schedule too much, too quickly, and responding stops or slows down, we're going through ratio strain. The response effort is too high. It's too hard to obtain that reinforcement. I'm going to stop responding. And that's what's happened here. It's now too hard to obtain reinforcement. The player stops shooting. Schedule's too thick. No, the schedule's too thin. Okay, Th Thick would mean low response requirement for reinforcement. Thin means high response requirement. The problem is ratio strain. Plants that live in the desert are often poisonous to protect against predators. Oops, sorry. Plants obtain the trait slowly over time. What best describes this poisonous trait? So when we talk about behaviorism and this idea that behavior is learned, it's passed down, we have three different things we're talking about. We have phylogenic, we have ontogenic, and we have cultural. Reactivity is nothing what we're talking about here. Okay, Reactivity is when your behavior changes in the presence of any other person or stimuli. We're strictly talking about behaviorism. So phylogenic, ontogenic, and cultural. Now, ontogenic and cultural are very similar. Similar, Cultural is just more specific to things like imitation and modeling. But both ontogenic and cultural have to do with operant learning history, right? Phylogenic is more genetic, okay? Traits and things are passed down over time. You slowly, slowly evolve over time. Plants that are poisonous in the desert and protect against predators who have trained the trait slowly over the time, well, they had to evolve, right? This trait had to be developed, it had to be passed down, it had to be evolved biologically and genetically, okay, through that type of history. Nobody came to the plant and started delivering antecedents and consequences to the plant, right? This is a genetic biological trait passed down over time. What best describes this trait? Phylogenic. And then finally, Landon goes on a trip with his family to New Mexico. He brings back a magnet that he wants to give to his BCBA. Can the BCBA take the magnet? Ah, the gift question, the gift ethical question. Okay, they've changed it. Now, we are allowed to take certain gifts, finally, as BCBAs. But the rules are, it can't exceed $10. It can't be routine, okay? And it has to be a gift, right? It's not an exchange. So... Landon brought back this magnet. Can I take it in the year 2022? A, the BCBA is not supposed to, but it won't really hurt. And you don't want to offend the client. Ethically, when we're dealing with ethical scenarios on the exam, we want to be as black and white as possible on the actual exam. Now, real life, we know it's not black and white. On the exam, you want to be by the book. So B, the BCBA can take the magnet if it's $10 or less. That is the new rule. Okay, go read it. It's important. The big, very very important change, right? This was a hot topic forever. They finally adjusted it. See, the BCBA should take the magnet, but immediately get rid of it once they leave. No, you don't have to do that. And then D, they know the BCBA needs to train the parents better on what is and is an acceptable behavior. No, that's way over the top, right? The kid brought you back a magnet. It's fine, right? As long as it's $10 or less.